Welcome back to another episode of the Startup Therapy Podcast. This is Ryan Rutan from Startups.com, joined as always by Will Schroeder, my friend, the founder and CEO of Startups.com. Will, we talk a lot about the impacts that a startup has on a founder's life. And generally speaking, those aren't the rosiest of conversations. But I think today we'd like to talk about how with a lot of deliberate design I and mean, probably some additional sacrifices that we can do things that allow our startups to augment and improve our lives as founders. It's not always a one-way downhill slope, right? Well, I think we look at it too, and we're like, oh my God, like my startup's taking so much time and it's so anxious and all these things. And we think, okay, I guess the alternative is I need to be doing the opposite of all those things. I need to be totally carefree and kicking back and I get to my <laughs> startup when I get to it because I'm too busy kayaking or whatever the hell I'd be doing, right? The reality is it's, it's not one or the other. It's a space in between. So I think part of the way that we can start building a startup that kind of drives our life the way we want it to is we chip away at it. And, and Ryan, you and I have done that over the last decade plus, like, like every year, every day, we try to chip away a little. I try to make the startup more of what we want it to be. And so I think what would be cool about talks about today is like, how do we get there? How do we make the kind of commitments? How do you know, how do we look at how does my startup work better for me in a way that we can actually get to without trying to change everything wholesale today? Yeah, that's a great point, man. Something you said I want to harken back to, which is that, you know, we, we tend to think of this in binary terms. And like, who, who knew? Founders love hyperbole? No way, right? But we tend to think about things in those terms, right? It's sort of this binary, like either, I either have this perfect life or I have this, you know, overwhelmed startup life, right? And there, there is a, there's right, plenty right. of room on that curve as we move from one extreme to the other. But I think there's, there's actually really something to that, which is that when we think of it in those terms, we talk about it in those terms, Terms, and we see ourselves at one end of that hyperbolic curve, the wrong end, that a lot of founders just don't even consider the fact that there are things we can do, to your point, to start chipping away and moving more towards the, the other side of that curve. Help me understand, because again, you and I have gone through this journey. I know mine. Yeah. I'm curious about yours. What did it look like lifestyle-wise 10 years ago? Like if, if you went back 10 years and you said, the life that I get to live now would seem insane compared to what it was before. And I say that because I think it helps to show that we're in a pretty good spot right now. We weren't always this way. So yeah. what would it look like 10 years ago? Well, uh, first of all, I've spent a lot of money on therapy trying to repress all of those memories, what my life looked like 10 years ago. So thanks for dredging all that back up, Will. No, I mean, it's, <laughs> let, let me let me stick on that point first, which is that if if I was Back 10 years in time, right? This would put us with, let's see, I'd have one child at that point. We were just getting things kicked off with startups.com. And if you had told me then what my life would look like now, I would have laughed in your face, right? And it's because it it's entirely different, right? In that 10 year period, we've talked about this before too, you have so many of these eras in your life as a founder and these different epochs that you right. live through. I'm clearly in a different one now than I was 10 years ago. And I, I sure. think important to note, the business is in a very different state too, right? And so, you know, what what is possible now certainly would have been possible then. And it didn't just happen overnight, right? To your point earlier, we chipped away and chipped away and chipped away, starting with the most critical things, right? Which was just by buying back a little bit of time first, didn't even really matter what I was spending it on as long as it wasn't just being spent burning midnight oil to, to build the business, right? Because at some point we were sure. just, I mean, we, we had so much going on at that point, right? We had just, we had started new families. We had been married for the first time. We had kids for the first time, building the business, not for the first time, this business for the first time. And it's unrecognizable the, the ways in which the business was controlling us, right? I would say at that point, sure. the business had 99% control over our lives. And at this point, it's still obviously the heavy driver in what we do on a daily basis, but I have far more agency in that relationship with the business and, and how we get to live within it. So, you know, going back 10 years, unrecognizable, right? It is magnitudes difference in terms of the flexibility that we have, the enjoyment that we're able to extract from the business itself. And I think that's something else that's really important to consider. This isn't just about your life outside the business, in terms of the lifestyle it gives you. At some point when you build this thing in a way that you really start to enjoy your day to day and you start to eliminate some of the things you didn't want to be doing within the business, even that becomes vastly more enjoyable and, and livable, right? It's not just about right. creating this balance and saying, oh, I've carved out more time outside of work. It's about what happens within the business as well for me. 
along those lines, then what we're saying is that going into our, our startup, it didn't occur to us that we could have this level of agency <laughs> no. for sure. that we could say, Hey, here are the yeah. things that I want to do throughout the day, but I get to do those. Like it's, it's hard to think in terms of, Holy shit. I have all this work to do. Like I, you know, 80 to hundred hours worth of work to do the idea of not doing it. And then going off and doing something I enjoy just sounds heretical. Like I just, that's, it seems 100%. like it can't, can't happen. I take it a step further, man. You said it would be hard to imagine saying yes to that. I would go a step further and say it would have been really hard not to just immediately say no to that, right? I would have just, my gut reaction would have just been like, okay, so, hey, Ryan, do you want to uh, spend a little time doing life design so that we can balance things out with the startup a bit more? Like, no, there's no room for that right now. I can't think about that. Okay. And so what happened though, is we took some baby steps. Do you remember like the first steps that like made you feel like some pressure was coming off? Yeah, for sure. I mean, some of it just came from just even adding team, right? There were, there were points at which like, as you grow and we added offerings to what we were doing, there wasn't anybody else there to catch that stuff. We were like, Hey, we should add consulting. Right. Cool. Who's right. going to do it? Us, right? Hey, we should uh, go and acquire another business and add a new line. Right. Hey, who's going to handle that? Oh, us. us yeah. Right. And so you know, just even having the luxury to add some more people in, which had nothing to do with life design, really, it was just more about what that allowed in terms of time right now. Yeah, there was still a hundred hours worth of stuff to get done, but there were a few extra hands that reduced that, you know, the, the balance that was required for us to do it. I'll say this, none of it, the, the stuff that I really remember most, and, and if I go back to the things that I remember most, there were, there were things that directly involved our health right? We weren't yet at a point where we thought about things like, well, let's just do this for our mental health benefit, right? Like, let's do this for all the reasons that we should. It was, hey, I've just wrecked myself and now I have to do something about it, right? So the commitments we made early on had nothing to do with us just sitting down and being smart. It was like, let's see, I, I can either push myself off the edge and die from this, or maybe I need to course correct a little bit, right? So I would say, man, some of those early commitments were made for us, not by us. Right, right. So from my standpoint, I think what happened is we tested a couple of these things, even when times were crazy. And this is what I want people to yeah, hear. Yeah. We didn't go all in big, oh my God, you know, we're gonna be able to do whatever we want, whenever we want. And I would argue 10 years later, we're still not not there. But we did do some things. For example, yep. when we start, first started testing work from home, which is hilarious yes. now, because 10 years later, it's like, <laughs> of course. But at the time, that was unheard of. And so the idea was on Wednesday, everyone at the office, this is back when we were all in the same office, would be able to work from home for a day. And I was terrified of that decision, right? Like, and I'm the one that suggested it because yeah. I thought it would be an interesting way to break up the week. Cause if you only had two full days that you had to get up and go to work and you had a little break in between, you know, it would make, make the week feel more digestible. And it did, but I just assumed everybody would take Wednesday off. I, I, I assumed <laughs> we were working we were moving to a four day work week, right? Yep. And that just yep. didn't happen. And so we tried it. And the truth is some people did move to a four day work week. I specifically remember having those conversations that'd be yep. like, look, Work from home still means work. There's still, still that part of it, right? Glad you're building out a very robust Facebook presence, but right, what we need you to be doing is working. I don't think, you know, again, it is also a new concept. So I don't think a lot of people really understood that. That said, we tried it. We, we dipped our toe and we said, hey, we'll try it for a month. I remember we specifically had like a, a turnoff period and we did it and the world didn't implode. We did have some challenges, but the world didn't implode. And I think that's what we're talking about here. I think that we're really talking about you can make these changes. You can't make them wholesale, but you can chip away at them just like we just described. And it adds up because what ends up happening is you chip away just a little bit and you're like, okay, we're going to try this one thing. and It's a little bit better. It's a little bit different. Sometimes it doesn't work, by the way. But when it does, like in other words, you say, you know, I am going to go watch my kid's game today. Whereas normally I'm missing all the games. I'm yep. just going to do it. And you realize nothing actually happened. Like everything was kind of just fine. And then you get in this mentality where you're like, well, what's the cost of not trying now? Because how many things could work, but I didn't, I didn't give it a chance. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And it, it takes a lot of testing, right? It takes a lot of, a lot of deliberation and a lot of planning and a lot of thinking. Like I said, you know, uh, be, being forced into some of these decisions Now we weren't forced into the work from home Wednesday. That was something we wanted to test because we thought it would be beneficial. I would, I would argue we were, we had, we had grown up a little bit more within the business at that point. I'm going back to things like our health, right? Like in my, in my case, one of the things, and, and this, again, this was incremental. We had to test things. We had to try, you know, as we, as we push the, the envelope further, those of you that don't know the history, you know, at this point, you know, we're, we're now fully remote. That was partially right, right. driven 
partially driven by the pandemic uh, from a couple of years ago. But by and large, we were already fully remote, right? We were only in the office two days a week and only some of the core staff that happened to be in Columbus, we'd already grown to in a couple hundred people at that point, vast majority of them weren't in an office at all. But that enabled things like my decision to leave Ohio for warmer climates due to my health condition, right? I needed to be somewhere where I wasn't going to deal with cold, dry, wintry weather. Uh, and so Florida was the first stop. And, you know, eventually, you know, we've landed in, in Antigua, Guatemala. But none of that would have been possible had we not been making those very deliberate and, and intentional changes. And I think that there's there's an important aspect to that. And you've talked about this before, Will, which is that the way we plan the business can align with some of these things, right? And so as, as I started to think through, how am I going to compose my teams? How am I going to, how am I going to lead the people that I'm working directly with? And if I want to be remote, how do I need to adjust my work style and how I'm right, building right. out teams and processes to account for that, right? So if I had built up a an entire, you know, uh, premise around, look, we need to have daily in-person stand-ups where we argue over who holds the whiteboard marker, that would not have lent itself well to what I wanted to do in the future. And so we had to build towards that. And I think that's, you know, again, it's incremental, but it was important. It took some time, took about a year of planning right. to be able to be in a position where I felt comfortable saying, I'm not going to be physically present anymore. And that's okay because the vast majority of what we were doing was already there. Right, right, right. And I think that, again, when you first look at it, it's scary. I mean, you, people sure. look at that, and they, oh, that person's off, you know, not working and they're, they're enjoying yep. their little aspects. You're like, you know, that must be easy for them to do. That's the hardest thing I've ever done. The easy part for me is working more. The easy yes. part for me is just putting in more hours because <laughs> yep. I don't have any guilt associated with it. Right. And I've always said this before. I have two modes, work and guilt. And I'm only <laughs> in one or the other. I'm either working or I'm feeling guilty. I don't have, oh, right? Man. So yeah. I admit this, right? I say this because I think from, from our standpoint, you know, people look at, at what we're doing or what we talk about and they're like, oh, it must come so easy for them. It does not. <laughs> it does not. Being able to chip away at this, let go a little bit or kind of, you know, design around something that isn't just work was way harder than just working. Because when I'm just working, I always feel like I'm accomplishing. I always feel like I'm playing offense. But when I pull up, this is probably a whole nother episode, but when I pull up, I get scared, right? Yeah, and so sure. this was very hard to do. But I think we made good commitments early on. We did. We did. And I think that to go back to another point you made, we also tested these things, right? We didn't make hyperbolic decisions to try to jump to the other side of that curve. We said, hey, let's start with one month of work from home Wednesday. We didn't say, hey, let's be a remote company, right? That would have been insanity. And it wouldn't have worked for a lot of reasons, not least of which we needed time to make that adjustment. But just emotionally, to the point you're making now, that would have scared us to death. Like we, we would have, we would not have navigated that well because we would have been so concerned, we would have gotten so caught up with how to manage that massive change in process that it wouldn't have been enjoyable. It wouldn't have given us what we wanted. And we probably would have botched it because it would have been too much at once, right? So these incremental changes, these stepwise things, and things that you can roll back. That's something else that we've talked about is, you know, what happens if this doesn't work? What's plan B, right? So anytime we wanted to test something, we knew what the follow-on actions would be. If it works, great, we can do more of it. If it doesn't, here's how we go back to what we were doing before without major penalties, right? And so you can feel really good about doing these things. Yeah, you've got an undo button. And I think, again, that's the part that that we get anxious about. Because like, well, I, I can't dial back or I can't make these other commitments or I can't try anything. Sure, you can. And if it doesn't work, and by the way, it usually doesn't work the first time. If it doesn't work the first time, second time, third time, you dial back. In exactly. the same way we did work from home. We said we're going to do it for, for one month. It was going to be a work from home month. I think it was during the summer, if I recall. And it went horribly. And what I mean by that is all the stuff that I was terrified about actually happened. People actually stopped working. People actually just took the day off, et cetera. All those things happened. But I was able to, to go through and start to say, okay, well, that's actually, the whole thing isn't broken right? Yep. We actually can, you know, make this work. But yes, there are some folks that either didn't understand what it was, or there's kind of bad apples, right? And those people end up washing out anyway, right? Because yep. that's just kind of who the folks were. If anything, yep. it kind of probably accelerated our understanding of <laughs> who's doing what. Yep. But, but again, I think we did two things well. I think from the one standpoint, we looked at it and we said, hey, there's certain things we want to do, and we can take baby steps toward it right? But there's other things that like we that may not work out, but we'll fix that. But that's actually part of being, you know, a, a, a startup, right? You know, sometimes you have to let people go. Sometimes you have to collar them back. Like either way, like there, there's a, a point where we can manage all that, right? It's For not sure. that hard to do. 
it's painful if we don't even try. You know what I mean? You know, something that's really funny about everything we talk about here is that none of it is new. Everything you're dealing with right now has been done a thousand times before you, which means the answer already exists. You may just not know it, but that's okay. That's kind of what we're here to do. We talk about this stuff on the show, but we actually solve these problems all day long at groups.startups.com. So if any of this sounds familiar, stop guessing about what to do. Let us just give you the answers to the test and be done with it. For sure. You don't gain, right? If you don't, you don't try it. It's, it's so funny to me that in, in certain aspects of our startup companies as founders, we absolutely seek out certainty particularly if it feels like it's going to benefit us, right? Because to your point, yeah, yeah, that exactly. guilt just floods in. You're like, I'm doing this for me, ergo, this better work out exactly as I think, or I'm not even going to try it, right? And so we try to read the tea leaves, we try to predict the future, which nobody's good at, right? So that's going to fail from the beginning. But it's really funny to me that we tend to do this to ourselves where we're fully willing to accept that nothing in our startup is certain as we, as we begin, we launch, we grow, we hire people, we try new products, do all this stuff under conditions of extreme uncertainty. And yet when it comes to anything that might reflect back on us personally, right, things that may be for our benefit, at that point we're like, I need to be sure about this. Why? Right. To your point, try it and see what happens and be willing to adjust and correct for whatever other mistakes happen within that as long as you feel like the final outcome is going to be great. And, you know, going back to the history on this thing with work from home, once we figured out, you know, what are sort of the guardrails we need to put up? What are the adjustments we need to make in communication? What do we need to tell people that we didn't think of before we started this? And once we did, we saw increased job satisfaction. We saw increased output in a number of places. <laughs> Imagine that, right? Yeah. Right? So all of these other good things happened, but there, there was, a, you know, there was an adjustment period. There were some rough corners that we had to, you know, sand off. And then at some point, things got smooth. Things got great. And then we continued, right? And then we, like, like I said, we rolled that out, you know, when I think we went from Wednesday to Monday and Wednesday, eventually Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then post pandemic all week, right? We're not in an office anymore. I think that the other thing that we did well, and I think this really, really, really served us well, is that we actually made these our corporate goals. So, so for example, with, with the work from home, that was something that I personally did want to try. Like I actually needed that in my life. But instead of saying, hey, I'm going to take Wednesdays and work from home, right? We made it for everybody. The part of that, just that's how we executed it. But the other thing that's interesting to me about that is by making the goal public, by making it kind of everyone's goals, it also kind of forced us to see it through, right? Because again, Ryan, if you and I had just taken off on a Wednesday and it didn't work out and, and things freaked out, like oh, we would have probably gone back on it. Bags. But now yep. that we've committed everyone yep. to doing it, we're kind of more plugged in. Now that kind of runs the opposite of what I just said a minute ago, which is you can't undo. Yeah, we can. We can make it a corporate goal and we can say, but it's got a four week shelf life and maybe we do it every June, right? So it does have an, uh, an undo button to it if we want it. But I found the more public we made, what we try to do, and Ryan, tell me if, if this uh, rings true to you. Years and years and years ago, we put together our uh, our corporate manual. Our like, mm -hmm. you know, when you join the company, this is kind of the, the user manual that. for the company. Yep. And one of the things we were talking about was like major life issues where you had a death in the family or, you know, maternity leave or just something where your life had just gotten thrown in its head. And our policy was just go handle life. Yeah. We'll be here when you get back. We'll be here. Right. Yep. You go figure your shit out. When time comes that we can get you back, we'll get you back. And until then, we'll just support you. Which sounded so antithetical to most people. They, they, they couldn't believe that was actually part of our policy. But again, this is us committing to that. It's hard to do. It's hard when somebody says, hey, I'm going to need to be gone for an extended period of time. And we have to somehow backfill or whatever, right? It's tough to do. But I also think by committing to those things publicly, showing that other people could reap the benefits of you know their life and kind of you know some of their uh, flexibility went for miles. And so I think externalizing what was important to us made a big difference. It did. It did. And I, I remember that period when we were talking about things like that and and trying to decide what we should include and what we shouldn't. Because certain things feel like more of a commitment, right? Something like that, where it's very open ended, well intended, but can cut both ways. I think there was some sense that we were both sitting there wondering how many people were going to file four year sabbaticals in order to sort their shit out, right? <laughs> like there was definitely some fear, unfounded, right? None of it came to pass. 
But there was there was a lot of trepidation around that. But, you know, ultimately, by publicly committing to that and, you know, putting some rails on it again, you know, and then just handling the one offs and, and helping people understand exactly what we meant and how to utilize it and how not to abuse it. It all worked out fine. Right, right. right. Worked out for the better right. for everyone. And what's interesting is I think when you do externalize these things, say, hey, these are things that I need. Like I need to see my kids more often or, you know, I, I need more time to work on my hobbies or whatever it is. And you tell everyone else that that's the case. Again, you externalize them. They start to go, hey, you know, I was afraid to admit it, but so do I. Yeah. Right. Like, I was oh, yeah. probably doing it anyway and just not telling you, but like I actually needed that too. So thanks for breaking down that barrier. Thanks for kind of giving me the space and the comfort to be able to have that conversation. Because again, it's not a given. A lot of people don't want to talk about it or they just assume, usually rightfully so, that you're not allowed to talk about it. Right. If I say, hey, I want to spend every Friday working my workshop all day. Right. Now I have to understand that if I say that, that's what I want to go do. I have to understand that everyone else is going to want to go do that too. Right. So again, as leadership, you know, we have to look at everybody else would have to have the same reaction or same benefit. But still, if, if I'm starting to say, hey, either I'm feeling burnt out or I'm feeling like there's parts of my life that aren't getting attention, et cetera, and I really need that, guess what? Chances are so does the rest of the organization. Right. Yeah. And so those are things that I think we could chip away at. But it helps when you start to talk about them uh, publicly. Oh, it helped hugely because had we not, and had we not, so it's one thing to like declare the policy, right? It's one thing to say, hey, we're going to do this. Yeah. I think the thing that we did that was really great was then to start to talk about how we were exercising those policies personally, right? Which I remember like having a ton of guilt around the first couple of times was like, you know, dropping posts into Slack or whatever we were using for mass communication at that point. Hey, you know, I'm going to leave a little early today. I got to go coach a soccer game. Didn't feel amazing on one hand, didn't feel amazing to say that right in the very beginning. And then as we did that, as we started to, you know, to put that communication out there, we saw other people chip in and start to say the same things. Hey, it's okay to do this. I'm going to go do something for my family. I'm going to go do something for myself. I need a little bit of a break. I'm feeling really burnt out today. I'm going to take a couple extra hours, whatever it was. And all of a sudden, that started to reduce the the guilt and the the misgivings around doing this kind of things across the board, which I think was hugely helpful. So not only was it wonderful to see that other people were doing that, it made it easier for us to do it as well. We didn't feel guilty as if it was just some sort of exclusive benefit we unlocked for ourselves that everyone else would be fully afraid to utilize and just dial the guilt up even further, right? Last thing we needed. Right. You know, it's interesting because I think we spend a lot of time when we're doing like corporate planning around our business goals. 100%. And so we're very good at articulating those and externalizing those. But I, I feel like there's we don't create the space typically as founders or leadership to say, these are my personal goals or, or this is these are the personal goals that I think the, the company should have. And we start to have those conversations saying, ideally, we'd flip the switch and all of them work the, the way that we'd love to now. But guess what? Like we don't have that luxury now. Google has luxuries that we haven't earned yet. That's why they get to do what Google gets to do. The rest of us still have to earn toward those. But what if, what if part of the conversation each year or whatever our increment is, is, hey, from a personal standpoint, here's what I'd love to have happen this year. And by the way, maybe it changes, right? Maybe this year I want more vacations. Maybe next year I want more time with my kids. Maybe the next year I want more time with my hobbies. Who knows? It depends on who you are. But the point is, if we start saying, hey, this would be my ideal condition. Now I understand it can't all work. Here's what ends up happening. Other people in the organization say, I can pick that up for you, right? Like if if you were to say, Ryan, if you were to say, hey, me and the family want to go on a four-week trip to do whatever, but I'm feeling guilty because I have a lot of of work to do, et cetera. But if you bring that up and then the rest of the team is like, bro, we got you, right? Like, yeah, go on the trip. And all of a sudden you're like, I would have never done that had I not externalized that. (laughs) Yep, exactly. If I had just kept that, you know, close to the vest and tried to play out the calculus and how that conversation would have gone, you wouldn't imagine it to go that way, right? Right. We've had a whole episode about this before where I said, I've been trying to like plan a sabbatical for like 30 years and it's in, and I actually don't yeah. believe it'll ever happen, but it's a, it's a great dream of mine, but I know it could. I know if I came to, to the team and I said, Hey guys, like I, I've been at this 30 years. I kind of need a minute. I'm going to go probably go build something. You guys would be supportive. Yeah. 100%. And, and, and I have externalized. I've talked about it for years. I haven't done it clearly, but I'm waiting for the right moment. And so my point though, is part of it is extracting that from all of us, from the team, from yourself, et cetera. To be able to say, this is exactly, this is exactly what I wish I could have, but I recognize this is the important part. That that doesn't mean I get it. I'm not entitled to it, even if it's what I want. 
The reason I say that is because if we go around the organization, we, everybody hops on Slack and we say, you know, we're doing this whole thing where we're committing to things that'll make our lives better and making the organization support our goals, et cetera. And it sounds like whatever you say, if you don't get it, you've been like, you know, deterred in some way. That's not a good situation, right? But if we were to say, here's, here's my ideal situation, I recognize that probably isn't compatible with the business, but what is? And imagine how many things you could pick off or said differently. Imagine how many things you're doing right now that you don't have to because you never brought it up. That's right. my thought. Yeah, no, I think that's that's a great point, right? It's, again, like if you don't air these things out and you don't get group buying or you don't get group think on it and you just try to sort it out yourself, it, it, it rarely goes anywhere, right? This is this is why, you know, when we're building an organization, it's a collection of humans, right? <laughs> especially at the early stages. And I'd argue that, you know, we were talking earlier about the fact that they're at early stage, sometimes it's really hard to think through these things. But that's also when your, your startup tends to be the most flexible in a lot of ways. And so I would, I would love to see people start to get more of that personal planning built in there. At the end of the day, and we've certainly talked about this on the podcast a number of times, why are we building these things? right? We are building them to enforce some kind of a, of a lifestyle, right? To try to create something for ourselves. Of course, there's the debt we want to make in the universe. There's the problem we want to solve for the users, the people we want to help. You and I are both insanely passionate about making founder life and journey a better one and a more productive one. And that is insanely fulfilling, but it is not the only reason we're doing it, right? There's personal gain to be had. There are things we want to accomplish, ways we want to grow that we feel like this empowers. And of course, right? There should be. It's a value for value exchange. And so I think that the earlier we begin to adopt that type of thinking, the better, right? Again, you may not be able to accomplish it. To your point, right? We might say, hey, I want to be able to do these things. That may not be compatible with the current capabilities or state of the business, but having it out there will let us know, okay, well, what do we have to do to get to the point where it is? And once it is there, then how do we transition from not doing that to doing some of that to doing all of that, right? Again, externalizing it, obviously important. I think the other part of it is saying, here's what I would want. Here's what, what my dream is. And it's okay if I, if I don't get there today, but I have to commit to making one tiny step toward that. And I, again, guys, when we look at where Ryan and I were 10 years ago, 11 years now, 11 years ago, how the business was running us, and it's supposed to, there is a certain point where like, you just got to do what you got to do. Whereas now we have far more agency over the business. We still have to get up every day and do our jobs, right? But we have far more control over how we do our jobs and under what terms. We get to say no to a lot more. And I think that's actually kind of the, the golden commandment for us is being able to, to say no to things. But we did it in tiny, tiny, almost unnoticeable in some cases, baby steps. And it was just a series of permissions where we either explicitly or implicitly gave it to each other. Right. And we gave each other that permission to say, yeah, go ahead and go do that. Right. And so the next time we're like, oh, you know, I don't feel so guilty about that. Or, hey, go do that and I'll get your back. Right. Like I used to be terrified of going on vacation. Now I'm 50 percent less terrified of going on vacation. <laughs> and, I, and I joke, but that's just my nature. Yep. Um, yep. But I know that you guys have exactly what you need to get stuff done. So I don't have to worry. But it took time to get there. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, it still happens, right? These things still creep in. When we look at, you know, there's all sorts of context that goes into this, right? It's not just where's the business? Well, where's the business? What's the macro environment? What else is going on in the world that might make me feel more or less comfortable with doing what it is that I want to do if it's straying outside of what we're already doing? Right. And so I, you and I talked about this just like two or three weeks ago, right? All of a sudden there was this whole series of events laid out in front of me that kind of came up, you know, circumstantially, right? I had this really yeah, interesting absolutely. trip I was absolutely. invited to go to some really interesting meetings that I could attend while I was there and really cool people to meet. Then I had to come back and I knew that this week, this week right now, there was going to be a bunch of stuff for the kids school because we're in the last week. So there's all these end of year presentations, orientations, meeting the new teachers, hearing the, the roundups, all this stuff. And then the following week I have to travel. I get to travel. I have to. I get to travel to Costa Rica to see my middle daughter compete in her first gymnastics competition. That's going to be epic and amazing. But taken all together, it was like, oh my God, I'm barely going to be in the office. All this, you know, what's going to happen? All yep. these things that I have to prepare yep. for. And it just felt overwhelming. And then we talked about it and you were like, dude, this is why we built this. What the hell are you talking about, right? <laughs> this is why we did this. So that those things right. don't have to be a hard decision, right? And yet they still are, right? Based on the context, based on, you know, there's always this push pull for me, right? Because, you know, to your point, there's, there's sort of work, which feels great. And there's everything else, which there's always some pull back to work, 
right? There's always some guilt. There's always some sense that, and not always guilt, right? Sometimes it's just like, man, I can't wait to dig back in and play with this thing that I'm working on and get it to where I want it to be, whether it's a new marketing campaign, whether I'm digging around for a new hire, whatever it is, there's enthusiasm and, and desire there. And so sometimes it's hard just to, to convince yourself that you should be trying to design something different, right? In my case, like there's often this pull that just makes me wanna be there. I just want to be doing work, knowing that there's a diminishing return to it, knowing all these things logically, but emotionally you still feel super attached. And that that is probably one of the, the harder barriers. I would argue, and I'd love to hear your thoughts, but if we look at that as a spectrum and we say like on one hand, there's the practical considerations, can the business support what I wanna do? And am I emotionally ready to actually do those things? I would say that in terms of what the actual barrier is, to me, it's it's the emotional side and it's the the, the mental gymnastics that we do as founders not really the practical considerations of what it would take to make it happen. The truth is you'll get your work done either way, right? You'll always go to the size of your fishbowl. Like uh, a great example for us is when we didn't have kids, we were working 80 plus hours a week. And then when we yep. did have kids, we actually just couldn't. Can't well, guess what? Anymore. We still got our work done, right? We like it, it just yep. happened to be we had less hours to get it done. And, and there's a point, and I think we did our last episode on, can you do a startup in less than 40 hours a week? I'm going to argue there's a point going the other direction where it's actually no longer feasible. You do need a yep. certain amount of hours. For but sure. my bigger point is that at the time, whatever seems like unattainable or the one thing you couldn't possibly do or the one move you couldn't possibly make as founders we shouldn't even be able to think like that as founders we, we are unlimited nothing is unattainable we can accomplish anything we can move mountains so for us to be able to look at our own goals the things that you know that we care about ryan and be able to say oh that can't be done runs totally counter to how we're exactly. built exactly yep anything to be done <laughs> you know what i mean yeah, except me, except my needs. I can do anything else, right? I can solve the most complicated engineering problems. I can build amazing software. I can satisfy our clients. But God forbid, I carve out an hour to work on me, right? Like, it's just, that's not possible. Not possible. And so here's what I would say. For all the folks listening that even gotten this far in the episode, like, yeah, like you said, yeah, that, that's them, right? I, I guess yeah. they must have some opportunity. <laughs> they must be making some kind of money or something like that yeah. where they have this option. No. No, let's be clear, right? Like we're doing okay, but we've been at this for 11 years nonstop, right? It wasn't like we just had a good year and we've been coasting since then. <laughs> on top of that, all of us have families. We have a lot of stuff going on, right? That is in our startup. So if you're 26 years old and you have no family and you have nothing else pulling at you other than your business, my point is you have twice as much time to do what we're doing and we're still doing it. It's not that it's hard to do. I think that's a myth. I think it's a myth that it's hard to implement implement these things that would help out personally and make our lives better. It's hard to, to try because you don't think you can. You think, oh, well, if I took two hours off and went fishing or whatever the hell it is that you do, that sounds super boring to me, but whatever it is that, that you would do. Oh, delicious. Yeah, I know. But you look at that and say, oh yeah, um, can't do it. You know, it, it's too big of a mountain. The truth is there's a different way to think about this. If we think about the things that are important in our life and we put as much time and effort and execution into making sure those things happen, guess what? They will get done. And our life will actually become exponentially better and we'll have a bizarre kind of uh, outcome, which is we'll actually have more energy to go back to work. I hate to say that that's the way I justify it, but it kind of is, but it works. All you have to do is make the commitment to chip away every day and over time it adds up. So in addition to all the stuff related to founder groups, you've also got full access to everything on startups.com. That includes all of our education tracks, which will be funding, customer acquisition, even how to manage your monthly financers. There's so much stuff in there. All of our software, including BizPlan for putting together detailed business plans and financials, LaunchRock for attracting early customers, and of course, Fundable for attracting investment capital. When you log into the startups.com site, you'll find all of these resources available.